This week, we're coming fresh off the heels of Black Hat and DEF CON, back in the studio, back in the saddle again, as it were. We're going to interview Daniel Meisler on IoT security. We're going to talk about stories of the week, including some Oracle woes and hacking cars. All that and more, so stay tuned. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild. Packets aren't the only things getting dropped. Systems aren't the only things getting hardened. Functions are the only things getting wrapped. Bits are the only things getting banged. And cocktails are flowing steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. This segment is sponsored by NetSparker, the developers of the only false positive free web application security scanners, enabling you to automatically identify vulnerabilities and security flaws in all of your websites, web applications, and web services. NetSparker scanners are available in two editions, NetSparker Desktop and NetSparker Cloud, the enterprise-level online scanning service. For more information, visit their website at netsparker.com forward slash security weekly. And by Pony Express. Check out the Community Edition and turn your Nexus 7 into a lean, mean pen testing machine. For all those hard to reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at PonyExpress.com. And by Anapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at onapsis.com. And by Tenable Network Security. Are you looking for a career change? Tenable's hiring. Everything from programmers to researchers. Check out all of the available open positions at securityweekly.com forward slash Tenable Jobs. If you're listening to this show, check out two positions. Both are technical. Both are work from home. That is a Nessus vulnerability research engineer and C software engineer. Now it's time to fire up a packet capture, pour yourself a beer or cocktail, give the interns control of your botnet. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian. Delighted to be here, as always. Uh, I am flying solo in studio. Of course, we have fabulous uh, hosts on the line via Skype. Mr. Carlos Perez is here with us. Welcome, Carlos. Or not. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, Can you hear me? He yes. How's it going, Carlos? Doing great. How's everything? You know, we're all doing good. We're all in recovery mode from Black Hat and DEF CON, which is always... Uh, no con flu? <clears throat> no, I, def I had con flu like as I went out there. I guess I had pre-con flu. Ah, yeah. So you were agent zero. Yes. Patient zero. I was patient zero. <laughs> uh, I apologize to everyone who has con crud or con flu. Uh, someone who escaped the con crud and con flu is not Kevin. Welcome not Kevin to the show. Hey, Paul, I think you just jinxed me. Now I feel awful. Yeah, yeah. No, he's not, I'm, not kidding, like, I'm out. Know. I'm I done. Go. I just soft quit the show. Drop the mic. That's it. <laughs> I'm done. I saw you while, uh, while I was out there. No. Yes. I was trying to hide. Well, you, you were DEFCON gooning, weren't you? Maybe. If you, if you saw a guy in a uh, tinfoil Pope hat, that, that might have been me. <laughs> I didn't see your tinfoil Pope <laughs> hat, but now I kind of want to. It was a good time. I was okay. officiating, making sure everybody was blessed of their sins of using the conference wireless. Mm. Excellent, excellent. Um, <clears throat> I think we have a couple of quick announcements. You need to purchase hack naked stickers and shirts online at shop.securityweekly.com. Are there also glasses? We have glasses. Do we have some uh, pint glasses? I was told we're not allowed to call them beer glasses because they actually weren't intended for beer. They were intending for bartenders to shake cocktails, not for beer. But it was convenient to put beer in them. But you're not supposed <laughs> to drink beer out of them. Did you know that, Kevin? No. <laughs> what? what? I'm, I'm thoroughly confused. Is the, it the traditional pint glass, right, was for bartenders to, like, shake drinks and mix and stuff. And then it was just convenient to put beer in them. But they're never meant to be a beer. A beer glass, a beer should actually be um, uh, consumed from a more like a goblet. <coughs> Excuse me, like a wine glass. So you get the full, like, aroma. 
So you're, you're telling me my entire life is a lie at this point. <clears throat> yes, I'm telling you those things you called beer glasses, Kevin, are actually pint glasses. And you can get yours, complete with the Hack Naked <laughs> logo, complete with the nipple, on our store. So go there. Uh, there will be a, a very, very steep discount being offered on our store. So make sure you join our mailing list. You can go to securityweekly.com forward slash insider. Join our mailing list. Do it now because we're going to send out a really deep discount to get rid of some of our inventory. So there might be some special deals in there. We're still working on, we're still plotting and scheming to see exactly what that's going to look like. But uh, we're going to be blowing some stuff out as uh, we sold a lot of stuff at DEF CON, which was fun. We were selling cigars, vapes. I mean, anything that landed on the table, dude, I was selling. Like, don't put your phone down on my table because I'll sell it. I was in, like, full-on sales mode. I was out of control. It was awesome. It was fun. Um, Larry's teaching SANS 617 wireless ethical hacking and defense coming up in Las Vegas. He's going back to Las Vegas on September 14th through the 19th. Um, and the Pen Test Hack Fest happening in November in Washington, D.C., and, of course, lots more places. Make sure you check the SANS website for more course offerings. Our good friends over at B-Sides Tampa have opened up their CFP. Get this. B-Sides Tampa is going to be one of the most unique security conferences on the planet. I don't know. This probably has been done. I know they used to offer this for general technology conferences. I, this may be the first time it's ever offered in security, but please correct me if I'm wrong. They are doing their conference on a cruise ship. That's right. Besides Tampa will be a four-night cruise. The conference is t- the two full days at sea. It'll stop in Cozumel, New Mexico. Uh, New Mexico. Cosmo, Mexico. Where did they get New Mexico from? <laughs> yeah, it's going to stop in New Mexico. It's going to be fabulous. You're going to see the desert. Uh, it's going to be awesome. Uh, so accepted talks receive, receive a free cabin for two. So you can bring uh, a friend, a significant other. You can clone yourself and bring two copies of yourself, one to go enjoy the cruise and one to give your talk. Um, I, Mike, the whole thing with this whole thing is, and I don't know how you guys feel about this, like, let's say I submit a talk, I get accepted, and I go. How am I going to compete with a cruise ship for my talk? Like, what could I possibly do in my talk to pull people away from, you know, drinking and, and debauchery and sunny, warm things? See, you have no answer. This is my point. Yeah, that, that's a tough challenge. It's a tough challenge. I guess right? there's, there's only one way to find out, and that's to submit. And that's to submit, submit and talk. go and find out. In worst case... You know, there'll be maybe a cruise staff member in the room that will learn all about some security-related topic that we'll present. <laughs> you know, I, actually, on a completely tangent note of, of random staff at places, one thing I found very interesting uh, being at the DEF CON Black Hat Hotels is the staff were telling guests to turn their wireless and Bluetooth off. I saw this happen multiple times to just random uh, uh, guests who were entering the hotel, which I thought was great. That's awesome. I suppose and if you're talking... drivers, too. Go ahead. Go ahead. A taxi driver, Sue? Yeah, absolutely. Nice. So I suppose on the cruise ship, if you were to give a talk about how to social engineer drinks, free drinks on a cruise ship, you might get people to attend. You might increase your chances a little yeah. bit. Then again, there's no internet access in a cruise ship. It, uh, they didn't say that. I, did, I read through their website, Carlos. I didn't see where you'd have internet or not. At least the ones I've taken in the Caribbean, yeah. they don't. Unless you want to pay uh, a leg and an arm for satellite internet. Right. Would your 4G like hotspot not work out at sea? Probably not very well. Nope. No, it won't. It won't work. It will, prob- it will probably work as you're approaching some of the, the other, islands yeah. that you're going. And as soon as you and get in range of a tower, you're screwed. And then it's going to be roaming charges. At least in the Caribbean, it's going to be like that. Let's say you go to one of the French islands or yep. the, uh, the ones that are uh, colonies from Poland and uh, others. Um, those are very expensive charges. <coughs> Interesting. So that's a way to keep your people focused. Like, hey, there's no internet. There's no porn. <coughs> you have to come see the uh, talk. You have to come see the talk. Yeah, and security people don't go outside anyways, so I feel like they'd actually have to go to your talk now. That's right. I think we just solved this. Well, if your talk is on day two, you know, the the really pale security people (laughs) 
are going to get really sunburned on day one. So you, you better have your talk like after at least a full day on the ship so that they'll want to stay out of the sun and maybe come to your talk. Be like, Phew, I got sunburn. I need to stay out of the sun. I'm going to go to a talk instead. I think other than the vomiting, they wouldn't even know they were on a cruise ship. This is true. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> Uh, well, that's Daniel Meisler, our special guest for this evening. I want to welcome Daniel to the show. He's a principal security architect uh, with HP. He specializes in application security with a spo- uh, focus on web and mobile application assessments. Um, in his spare time, he enjoys reading, writing, programming, rowing, and table tennis, as well as also being one of the leaders for the OWASP Internet of Things Top 10. Daniel, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Daniel, how did you get your start in information security? Uh, I actually started by defending uh, the university network. Mm, me too. Uh, which was a massive soup sandwich back in uh, 98. Uh, yeah, lots, lots of issues. And it was sort of like uh, I just started asking questions. We were actually, I was actually in a computer lab. Um, doing some web development for like online courses Mm -hmm. and um, just boxes were just falling. Um, It was, you know, basically mayhem. And um, there was one really smart guy there who knew Linux and knew Windows. And uh, I was in the middle of doing like an MCSE and uh, he ended up leaving and I ended up taking over and installing Linux on a bunch of Windows boxes and just kind of expanded from there until I was uh, doing security for the whole network. Uh, did you stay there through 2003? Um, no. Right, no. So, so you left before things got really good when the slammer worm and everything were coming out. That was a fun time to be at a university. Yeah, it was, <laughs> right, it was right about that time. That, that was crazy. Yeah, there were some other worms that ran around uh, before 2003, but that was... Um, those were interesting times, especially to be at a university. Yep, absolutely. We have, you know, I got some fun and interesting stories about that. Um, so where did, you, uh, where did you end up after that? I uh, went to work for a credit card processor, mm-hmm. um, doing uh, firewall engineering, IDS, uh, lots of different InfoSec uh, stuff there. And then... Um, Immediately went into pen testing after that. Mm-hmm. Is that what you do for HP today? You don't do pen testing still, do you? Um, I do, um, but I'm not a billable pen test resource. Like It's not what I'm mm-hmm. supposed to be doing. It's not what I do all the time. But um, yeah, so I maintain the uh, technical methodologies, uh, mostly for web. Mm-hmm. Uh, my my NetSec foo is a bit rusty, honestly. Um, but I've been focused on web uh, web hacking for like the last 10 years or so. What are some of your favorite web application assessment tools and techniques? Um, well, I work for HP, so I really like WebInspect. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you get a free copy of WebInspect. That's nice. Yeah, yeah. No, WebInspect is a good enterprise tool. I also like um, Burp is my main go-to for a manual tool mm-hmm. uh, because WebInspect is definitely focused on the... Uh, on the commercial side and the um, enterprise side, so um, Burp is my preferred uh, manual tool. Gotcha. What are some of your favorite Firefox plugins? Every web application pen tester has their favorite Firefox plugins. It seems to be the platform to do manual web applications assessments. Yeah, you know, I I um, I don't use them much anymore. I, I usually stay inside of Burp mm-hmm. um, for doing manual stuff, um, in addition to a number of other scanners. And then um, the other thing I do is uh, kind of related to a project. We actually just presented on um, Seclis, the project, um, mm-hmm. at Black Hat Arsenal, which is a collection of, like, uh, pen tester uh, lists. It's like a pen tester's companion. Mm-hmm. And you basically – it's one uh, GitHub repo that you download, and it's full of fuzzing lists. It's full of the best password lists. We, like, curate the best stuff from all over the Internet. And um, – have it all in one place. So that's kind of the thing I use in addition to, uh, you know, burp and other manual tools. So is it like tools or really just like resources that, what, when, what is the project called again? It's called Seclist. Mm-hmm. Um, 
it's like number two if, if you go a little behind the uh, mailing list. But um, <coughs> but basically, it's password lists, username lists, fuzzing strings, mm -hmm. um, discovery, web shells, uh, grep strings. It's basically anything you could possibly need in terms of like the best lists out there to use with your manual tools. <clears throat> That's awesome. That's a great yeah. resource. Yeah. I know every every pen tester has their like own mini collections of all of those, uh, or probably some very large collections of all of those resources. So, did you do that on your own, or did you present with someone? Yeah, I presented with uh, Jason Haddix. It's mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was it was a joint presentation. It was our first Arsenal talk, so it was pretty cool. Um, lots nice. of cool cool tools at uh, Arsenal this awesome. year. Yeah, what was some of the other things that you saw at the? Uh, I didn't get a chance to go to the Arsenal talk, so. Um, so I saw one thing that um, Jan was doing, who uh, plays CTF with uh, Shellfish. He actually runs the Shellfish group, and he was uh, releasing some cool utilities to help with uh, CTFs. Um, and then the other cool one I saw was uh, Jonathan Cran yeah. uh, was releasing a framework um, that basically helps with discovery. Uh, I believe it's called Intrigue. Uh, it was... Well, it was intriguing, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Jonathan's a great guy. Um, yep. So how did you get to come to do some research uh, and investigation into uh, Internet of Things security? <clears throat> um, I, I, I'm not sure exactly. It, it just uh, was kind of interesting to me, and I started exploring it, uh, doing it for work, and then also just writing about it on the on the site and everything, it's just kind of turned into its uh, its own main thing for me, uh, being a central focus. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, how did you did you initiate with OWASP to create the the top ten list for IoT, or did they come to you? Or no, I reached out to them and, and asked. And this is probably two and a half years ago or so. I reached out to them and said, "Hey, can we do IoT?" Um, the reason I asked is because you know it's. It's weird because open web application, right? So, but we already have mobile. We already have a number of other spaces in OWASP. So I didn't see why we couldn't do IoT, and they were super open to it. I usually just reach out to uh, Jim Manico or uh, Michael Coates and ask them, uh, you know, if something is legit or not. And they said, absolutely, go, go and do it. Um, so, how did you how did you come up with the top? 10 lists and, and what are some things that are that are on there that you want to educate our listeners and viewers about yeah so uh it's funny you mention that so it's uh what i, I did also a different talk a defcon talk in the iot village on the um, attack services project so basically what what we've done and uh, by the way i do the project with um craig smith and it's a little confusing they're actually Two Craig Smiths in um, IoT, amazingly enough. Um, one, I, I forget the name of the org that uh, he works with. I think he does a lot of cavalry stuff with Josh mm -hmm. Gorman. Yep. <laughs> but, um, yeah, the, the other guy, Craig Smith, uh, works on my team uh, here at HP. And uh, he's the other guy that, that um, helps out on the uh, OWASP project. But basically, it's no longer... We're going to migrate it over fully um, January of 2016, mm -hmm. but it's no longer a top 10. So the top 10 lists, um, I, I created that list name because top 10 has a good brand, basically, mm -hmm. and we thought it was pretty intuitive. And we ended up with roughly 10 surface areas, but I sort of made a couple of the mistakes that I hate when OWASP projects make, which is mixing... Uh, Vulns, threats, and uh, risks, right? So I had like privacy concerns. I had like web applications. Um, I actually just uh, caught most of your talk that you just did at B-Sides. Mm. You actually had some surface areas there as well that you talk about. Um, but the, I didn't like artificially being forced into 10, which mm -hmm. is obviously what a top 10 list does. And um, I really wanted to break out and be more discreet with the list. So what we've done is created an, um, basically a, uh, a separate top 10, or I'm sorry, a separate surface area project. And the surface area project, 
covers all the different ways that you can attack any IoT system. That, that's the goal anyway. It could, less could be super dumb, which is the whole point of having it out there, is people to say, actually, these should be combined, this one should be broken out, this one's, you know, dumb and shouldn't be on there at all, or why did you forget these three? Like, we're open to that. But what I did was just come up with the surface areas and not be bound by, oh, I hope we can get to 10. Right. Um, and we ended up with, like, I don't even know the number, but it's like 16. So I'll just read some of these off. Um, ecosystem access control, which is basically a holistic view of authentication, session management, and access control for the entire ecosystem, right? Because mm -hmm. um, it's it's not just a device, right? You've got a mobile app. You've got a cloud, cloud functionality. You've got these sensors. And oftentimes, one component will just implicitly trust some other component, and auth will be completely broken, session management is completely broken. Um, just so, so what I wanted to do is have one surface area that talks about how do the various components interact with each other, and that includes how do you um, provision, bring in a, a component into the system, uh, take it out. Um, what happens if you lose access to a component? How do you get it back into the system? Like all these sorts of things, uh, I'm not sure uh, most people are looking at. So that's one. Uh, device memory, obvious. Uh, device physical interfaces. Device web interface. Uh, device firmware. Device network services. Administrative interface. So this is a, another one worth mentioning. Uh, administrative interface is worth mentioning because it could be, keep in mind, this is for toothbrush. Um, fish plaque, um, airplane, skater network, uh, sprinkler system, right? right. The, the, goal, the goal is to have these surface areas apply to anything that is, you know, connected to a network and sort of bridges the gap between, you know, physical and digital. So, Well, I like where you're going, and, and where you started out has certainly a ton of components, right? Those things you mentioned in between are commonalities between all the devices, Right. But the big common denominator that you're talking about now with administrative access is even if a device is part of an ecosystem, there has to be, in most cases, some kind of management interface for that device directly, right? And that's the interface you would use to maybe connect it back into the ecosystem or update the software on the device, perhaps. Yep. But that administrative component is a lot of times what we're taking advantage of, and that administrative component could be a web interface, it could be FDP, it could be SSH, it could be... Um, a separate thick client. But yeah, it could be a separate API that it's talking to the cloud and you're interfacing with that way as well. So, Yeah, absolutely. So that's, that's exactly right. So I have on there um, the device web application, right? In a lot of, you know, home environments, the device web application that runs off, you know, whatever the router or whatever it is, sprinkler, that is the administrative interface. But what I wanted to capture with a separate surface area is that that could be completely separate. For like a skater network, you might have a separate thick client that manages everything or a separate web app that manages everything that is separate from the web app that sits on a sensor or oh, okay. on, on a device. Right. So, so really what these surface areas are supposed to do is remind a tester or a manufacturer, did you cover this? And for each one, it's got a number of uh, examples and vulns, and we're continuing to build that out. But the idea is, hey, look, did you turn over every rock, right? So, um, yeah, administrative. Daniel, you know, it's interesting. One, you kind of touched on it about the different audiences. Uh, you know, there's uh, security of IoT for the user. There's the security of IoT, I think, inside corporations kind of thing. But yep. then there's, like, what the vendor needs to do to yep. make these things secure. And I feel like that, I actually firmly believe that as a research community, we've pointed out, security community, we've pointed out lots and lots of flaws in these devices, in these systems. And yet, still today, coming to market, our vendors making these devices insecure. What's going to help us bridge that gap? What's going to help us convince manufacturers of all of these IoT devices that there yep. needs to be some security? Yeah, um, basically it's going to be force from the bottom up, which is consumers, 
And it's going to be, honestly, it's going to be forced from the top down, which is government. Um, FTC, I don't know if you've interacted with them at all, but they take their job very seriously when they detect, you know, air quotes neglect. And sometimes it is neglect, but sometimes it's air quotes neglect. But when they see neglect, they go after a group and say, look, you put users in danger, you know, you put data in danger, you did this and that, and you should have done otherwise. So I think, um, and both on the HP side and on the sort of uh, public side, I've been helping a number of groups try to build these standards, right? Um, on the government side, which will eventually seep down and become minimum uh, standards for security. So I think it's going to be a simultaneous push up uh, from above and up. But the problem is you can't have an up push if consumers don't understand the problem. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you going to do at Best Buy? Like, you're like, well, th the thing is, you got to look at your PCAPs, right? And you got to understand if your data is leaving. Yeah, upgrade that, your firmware. That, yeah, upgrade your firmware. That doesn't work at Best Buy because they don't know yeah. what you're talking about. Um, so, so, so what you what you say is kind of like that top problem that needs to be tackled first. Uh, do we need to kind of enforce that all of these different companies at least provide a way to update their gear or registration so they can actually communicate with the users and tell them, hey, there's a new update, you need to apply it either online or, off or offline. What, what is that kind of like that first approach, that first step? to start securing all of this IoT infrastructure? I, I think the first thing is just talking to the manufacturers and letting them know that it's serious. They're going to get it from multiple angles, right? They're going to hear it from government. They're going to hear it from CNN. They're going to hear it from security researchers and just, you know, articles online. But what we've done with our project, um, and we have some sister projects, by the way. We have um, I Am The Cavalry, which is Josh Corman and a bunch of other people. Uh, there's also Build It Securely, which is Mark Stanislav and Zach Lanier. And so Build It Securely is basically Soho groups um, or, or small businesses, basically startups and such, who want to get their stuff tested and they link directly with a security researcher. And maybe it's free, maybe it's cheap, whatever. So that's one project. The other project is sort of public safety and that's Josh Corman and I Am The Cavalry. And wh what I'm trying to do with this project, with the OWASP project, is give prescriptive guidance of what to avoid and how to avoid it, right? So listing the surface areas with um, each one of them containing the actual vulns that you need to avoid most importantly. So if you click on these tabs, you click on the manufacturer tab, it says, here are your surface areas, make sure you do this, make sure you do this, make sure you do this. And it's at least something that if a dev is looking at it and the company takes security seriously, they can at least go and investigate and say, wow, I was about to ship this, and now I'm not going to because I read this list. So yeah, The problem with that, though, is that a lot of these IoT or embedded device manufacturers don't take ser security seriously. Yeah. At all. I mean, well, absolutely. And that'll it, just come with CNN, right? I mean, that'll come with the same way security is taken seriously anywhere else, which is eventually the pressure is applied strong enough from enough angles, or maybe just once with a strong enough force that now suddenly they're hiring some people. I know. I'm on the fence about this particular subject, Daniel, because we see the stunt hacking that goes on, which I think that term in and of itself is, is really bad. But <laughs> in a lot of times, in order for us in the security community to point out how bad things are, we have to show people how bad things are. So we have to take control of the car on the highway. We have to do, you know, hack an ATM machine and make the money come out on, on state. We have to show it to them. But there are also others, and I think Josh Corman is a great example of this, who are working at a more political level, I guess you could call it, yep. uh, to help people understand these problems without, you know, ha having someone having to stand up in a public forum and immediately show how <coughs> bad things are. I, I mean, if you relate it, relate that specific thing to um, health, right? It would be, well, let's watch this person have a heart attack from eating fast food every day. You know, like we don't, we don't do that. There are lots of better ways, I think, to to educate people. 
However, I think the reason why we use this stunt hacking as a crutch is because historically it's had some success. When people see, oh my God, I can actually now visualize like how bad it is if I don't apply a firmware update to my router because you know Paul owns all my bank accounts now, like that's bad. And I feel like we're forced to use that as a crutch. And I don't, I don't think we're going to grow as quickly as we can as an industry if we start relying too much on this uh, uh, kind of stunt hacking. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think there's a hybrid that's available, right? So let, let's take, for example, the Billy Rios and the insulin pump, mm -hmm. right? So um, do you have, you have IV, it? He was IV pump. Was it? Okay. Yeah, IV pump. Yes. So IV pump. So you've got this, you know, life-saving apparatus that could be compromised and you can change uh, all sorts of things that can affect lives, right? So what you can do is you can have the Billy Rios research and a sort of a stun hacking angle. And then you can go and do vulnerability assessments on a hundred other devices and say, guess what? These are waiting to be exploited. They're just there and they're available. It will happen if we don't get serious about this. So it doesn't require us to do a hundred more stunts. Right. But, but we can sort of leverage that single one to, to get people to take it more seriously. Yeah. I mean, Billy got some press, but, Nobody saw anyone die as a result of that, right? I guess the ultimate stunt would be, hey, look, I hacked into the IV pump and that person died. That would be bad. Um, no, I, I hear you. you I hear you. Mean? I do hear you. But so I, I think that um, <laughs> as far as dying, I don't know. But I think we're, we're going to see a lot of impact. Um, I think the combination of all these things going online with Shodan, where it's easy to find this stuff, so you have like so one person announces this thing is vulnerable. You're like, well, there's 4 million those online and I've actually got an IP address for them and I can inter interact with them as a result of Shodan. I think the turnaround time between research, whether it's public or not, and actually doing something is, is going to shorten. Yeah, I mean, I mean, unfortunately, the problem with that is the, the consumer doesn't really care about Shodan, and the manufacturers are pretty unimpressed by it as well. And it's really hard to get pressure from both sides um, and do that in a, in a way that has an impact. You know, in the IV pump example, you know, I can't go in as a, well, I could, but I'd be laughed out of the hospital. You know, I'm going to go into the hospital as a consumer and demand that my IV pump be secure. Um, and that the uh, kind of ironic thing about that is that when Billy was in the hospital, he was hooked up to one of those IV pumps. Uh, yeah, he looks over and it's the same device. He's like, ooh. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, I don't think that the hospitals necessarily in that example are demanding that they have secure IV pumps. And the government isn't demanding that people make IV pumps. And we need to maybe not think of it as pushing from different sides different sides of the problem, but all working together as each one of those audiences are effective either negatively or positively or in a different way, but they're all affected by this problem. Um, some don't well, yeah, know. Yeah, you're I mean, influencers, right? Right, and yeah. the vendor could be negatively affected in the future by this problem. If you know things blow up for them, it could mean bad news for the vendor, but likely people are still going to buy IV pumps. Uh, people are still going to buy wireless routers. People are still going to buy smart things, home automation systems. You know, people are still going to buy these things. So it's not hitting the vendor's bottom line just yet because people aren't changing their purchasing habits based on the security of a device. And that, I think, is one of the huge problems that we have today when it comes to IoT security. And, well, and, and not only people, but also uh, organizations. For example, the IV pump is a hospital system. For how many years haven't we mentioned that there's a lot of equipment in hospital that still runs Windows 2000, Windows XP. Right. They run very old versions of Windows. And one of the biggest caveats and problems is government and their laws with uh, certification of the product. It is so expensive just to get one product certified and all of a sudden you apply a service pack. Now you have to pay a lab 75, 80,000 just to recertify that piece of gear and probably you're selling three, four, five pieces of gear a month. That's a very big hit in your bottom line. So not, not only do we have to create consciousness on the buyer side, but we also have to modify probably some of the laws that 
uh, create this problem in the first place for some of the vendors, not for all, but for some. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so one example of that influence is like, um, so I'm part of this uh, med hackers group, which is connected to the cavalry, and we're looking at, you know, talking to physicians, like informing them. We're looking at talking to hospital administrations uh, that are responsible. They actually are a choke point for what vendors are allowed to go into the organizations, right? So we could get together, talk to them, inform them of, hey, you know, we found 300 more volumes just like this other one. And, you know, this is something you you don't want to be a part of, so let's let's work security into this. There are also a number of orgs that um, actually do quality control for the devices that go into the hospitals. And another angle we're looking at is integrating security into those quality checks. So yeah, I mean it's it's similar to the public announcement of Codenomicon uh, getting the contract with UL. You know, I mean that's something mm-hmm. I read about on their website. That's great. You know, that's the makings of some great beginnings when we talk about security of these devices is having some kind of uh, certified standard like that uh, that we can hold these devices against uh, and they won't get the certification if they don't pass certain yep. security tests. Uh, it's going to take a long time before we hit all the different areas that these devices are in because as technology evolves, these devices are everywhere. They're used for everything now. Um, and that's just going to continue to grow. So this problem is going to get bigger. I think it was Bruce Schneier that's quoted as saying this problem is going to get worse before it gets better. It's probably going to be some fallout from it before we realize, uh, you know, how costly that's going to be. And it might be too late in some cases. We may we may lose a lot of piece of people may lose a lot of money, um, and there may be damages associated with this problem until uh, we figure out how to fix it. And I think certification and standards like the UL is the beginnings, it, just the beginnings, not the, you know, silver bullet, but the beginnings of, of where we need to be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you want me to read the rest of these uh, things real quick? Sure. What else you got on this? Yeah, I'm curious to see what you've added and expanded upon from the top 10. Yeah. So, um, so we talked about administrative interface, local uh, data storage, which seems pretty obvious. Um, cloud web interface, which is separate from the device web interface and also different from a potential separate administrative interface. Mm -hmm. Um, Third-party backend APIs. So one thing we found uh, at HP, we did like three different studies and we're always seeing the data that we enter being like fire hosed all over the internet. Uh, Between like five and like 12 hosts, it actually goes out to. And whether we man in the middle of the connection to find the data going out or we actually just run strings against a PCAP uh, to, to see the data go out clear text. We, we see our honey tokens basically being spread out to like these multiple backends. So we break out third-party backend APIs as being like a, a surface area. Um, update mechanism, this one is absolutely huge. Uh, I think you, you mentioned it all the time. You mentioned it in your talk at B-Sides. Update mechanism is critical in, yeah. in, our, re- in our research we found, I mean, people are using FTP. Um, the update server itself is world writable and not only hosts the, the software for the product we're testing, but all of the company's products. Um, no signatures, which means you can modify and re-upload, just all sorts of drama. Um, uh, mobile application, massive surface area, vendor backend APIs, separate from third-party backend APIs, ecosystem communication. This is another interesting one that it is not in uh, sort of any other list that I could find. And this is like beacons, like how do devices uh, sort of health check each other? How does the um, the central administration system beacon and health check the various devices that are in the ecosystem? How does it uh, check for version updates? How does it push updates? That sort of thing. So it's like the uh, communication fabric, basically. Um, And then network traffic, which is LAN, LAN to internet, short range, uh, non-standard, non-TCP IP, um, you know, short range or or WAN traffic. So those are kind of the... uh, the surface areas there. Excellent. <clears throat> um, so what's like the next step uh, 
for helping IoT uh, with your project, Daniel? Uh, so this um, surface area project is actually part of um, an overall IoT project under OWASP. So the first project in this greater umbrella is the attack surface areas. But the next one is going to be um, either a testing guide, which is basically analogous to the OWASP testing guide, except for, for IoT. Um, and then another list that's more similar to a top 10, which is the top vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. um, so it's basically, um, and actually someone during the talk at DEF CON came up with the idea of you know, what are the guidelines around how does a very large enterprise deprovision IoT devices, which could have their sensitive data still stored on the device and stuff. So I feel like a lot of different projects will probably spring up and just live under this umbrella. Um, actually, another example that was also brought up in the talk was um, someone wanted to design a standard for a secure update system so that when manufacturers have no clue how to build one, they can come to the thing and say, here's how you should do your encryption. Here's how you could do key rotation. Yes. Here's how you can do transport. More of that, right? I'd like yeah. to see a standard like Ed Scotus mentioned on the show, a standard for authentication to the device itself. Absolutely. I'd, you know, I'd like to see a standard for providing a web interface on the device and being able to manage it, a secure web framework for management as well. Um, all of those things, I think, are huge areas of growth in terms of security for Internet of Things and these smaller devices now um, that you find everywhere. And we didn't even talk about Andrew Hayes' example of you know all those Samsung Smart TVs being enabled in all of the corporations that he found in his research. Oh, absolutely. That's one of the main things I talk to corporate customers about is it's going to get easier to record. And this is kind of a wearables conversation, but, you know, you have people looking at slides, you have people listening to boardroom conversations. How easy is it going to be to record and capture and live stream and tweet or whatever? Very sensitive things being said in the workplace. Um, and I think the the Andrew's example of the TVs is a good, good uh Good abuse case. I mean, you basically have, <laughs> I mean, so many of these devices actually are doing this now, it, it, constantly listening, constantly uploading, and then parsing to see if it was something interesting. Right. Um, yeah, the other thing, real quick, um, I released a tool. Uh, that's kind of a big word for what it actually is. It's just a, a script, really. But what it does is it helps you parse IoT traffic. Um, during an assessment. So I call it a uh, Kaparser. It's actually on uh, GitHub. And what it does is you capture a PCAP uh, during an IoT assessment. And you um, basically you, you put in honey tokens. I, I like to use Wombat for some reason. Um, but you enter honey tokens into the mobile app, into the device web application. Um, you, you know, exercise the, the full ecosystem as much as possible while capturing all TCP IP traffic destined for the internet. Um, and I've got this uh, dual, com, dual com tap, mm -hmm. 180 bucks, super cheap from Amazon. And it allows you to you know, tap all traffic destined the, for the internet. And then you basically run this script um, and it basically uses T-Shark and uh, TCP dump and strings. And it, what it does is T-Shark busts the... Um, bust the stream into individual hosts that your ecosystem interacted with. Then TCP dump breaks separate PCAPs for each destination. Then um, pulling from set lists, we look for uh, sensitive words inside of each stream. And of course, if you get any hits, especially for Wombat, which was your secret you know, honey token, you probably got a critical finding because that was supposed to be encrypted. And if strings caught it, it wasn't encrypted. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like an instant, uh, if you get any hits on this thing, plus it just gives you visibility showing you that, hey, you actually just interacted with 13 hosts. It wasn't one back end for the vendor. It went 13 different places. And you could see the host list. You could see how many pieces it got broken into. And you could see if there were any hits for SSN, DOB, secret key, um, 
wombat or whatever your uh, whatever your honey token was. And if you if you have any of those, it's almost like an instant higher critical finding. <clears throat> that's really cool, and that's on your GitHub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <clears throat> excuse me, definitely something I'm going to be playing around with. That's a great way to test the uh, devices, and I think people will be. Even people in the security community are going to be kind of shocked as to just how leaky these devices are and how poorly implemented a lot of the, the protocols Absolutely. and so-called security measures are. Excellent. Yep. Daniel, are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? Absolutely. Three words to describe yourself. Uh, can I change my answer about when to play? Um, let's see. <laughs> um, no, you can't. <laughs> how about that? Um Student, reader, writer. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Um, a frozen ice pick. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Um, no idea. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Uh, not at all. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Mm. Sam Harris and Rachel Meadow. Excellent. Daniel, thank you so much for appearing on Security Weekly. You can find uh, all links to Daniel's projects, GitHub, uh, Twitter, and personal website in the show notes for this episode. So, Daniel, thank you again. All right. Thank you for having me. Everyone stay tuned. We're going to take a short break. Come back and do the stories for this week. <laughs> 